the slide is very clear and the support with the lecture is very, very, uh, very beautiful, very clear. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, the, I, I am very pleased uh, to introduce uh, you to you the biography of the professor Michael Fayon, who was trained uh, as a pediatrology, pediatric immunology in Bordeaux, Montreal, Canada, and Paris. He holds a master on uh, degrees in clinical and epidemiological research in the University of, of Montreal and a doctoral philosophy in health biology in the University of Bordeaux. His special interests are preschool weeping, asthma, cystic fibrosis, pediatric and health education to patients. He is currently a physician at Edinburgh University Hospital and has held position in the executive committee of the European, European Cystic Fibrosis Society Clinic, Clinical Trial Network, the Scientific Committee of the National Pediatric Allergy and Asthma Society, and the International Congress in Pediatric Pulmonology Committee. Professor Fayon is also a current member of the French Society of Pneumology, the Lang Francais, and its Indian Ocean counterpart, the European Respiratory Society, and uh, the uh, European Cystic Fibrosis Society. Uh, Michael, as you like, the scene is yours. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. yes I will share my screen. Um, I'm just looking for the Sorry. What was uh... Can you see the screen? Yes. So so thank you um... Mr. President, and thank you for, to the organizing committee for having invited me to this uh, very interesting meeting, multidisciplinary, and welcome everyone. Um, my talk is about the respiratory system. I have a background in neonatology and intensive care, but at the present time, I'm working as a pediatric pulmonologist. So my talk will be divided into three parts. I would just remind you how the lung is built and how it functions normally. The second part would be how it develops and grows prior to birth, at birth and after birth. And then if we have time, and it depends on the president, uh, we might talk about the disease states. There are a number of disease states which are pertinent to this presentation, like malnutrition, antenatal smoking, substance abuse, prematurity and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, malaysia of the airways like laryngomalacia or bronchomalacia, lung malformations, asthma, and cystic fibrosis. Excuse of course, me, hello, hello. excuse me, Mike. I don't see your slides and I see the, the, the file, first uh, thousand day lung fayon 12, but uh, I don't have your slides. It's the same for everyone? Yeah, same for everyone. I try again. I stop. Yeah. Share. Any better? Yes. Yeah, we can see them. OK. So for the sake of time, I won't be able to develop all the disease states, but maybe you should send it via chat uh, a sort of vote as participants to select one or two disease states and we'll discuss about the the one that most asked for so 
So let's look at the first part, the structure and function of the respiratory system. So when we look at these uh, small, beautiful babies, we see only small holes, the nostrils and the mouth. And it's a wonder what's going on behind the small holes. And uh, we always ask ourselves, how do these babies breathe? Do they breathe by the mouth, by the nose? And when they breathe in, what happens to the air? And when they breathe out, what is the reason that the air is coming out? So first there are the airways, the upper airways and the lower airways. So in the upper airways, the supraglottic airways, pr consisting primarily of the pharynx here, there is intake from the nose that is sure and it's not sure whether the small babies can breathe by the mouth. Uh, in some textbooks, it is said that babies are obligate nose breathers and they can't breathe by the mouth. And we'll see whether this is true or not. And then there's the glottic part, the vocal cords, the subglottic cord area and the cervical trachea. Part of the trachea is outside of the chest and part is inside the chest, intrathoracic. And the, the, the function is different and the, the, the clinical expression of disease might be different. And then of course, there's the intrathoracic um, trachea and the bronchi and the bronchioli. And as we go further in the periphery, the surface area will increase because there are more and more bronchi and bronchioli. Now remember, we have just seen this, this part, the upper airways and the, the, the lower airways, and this is connected to the air sacs, as you can see here. So the air that's coming into the lungs will exchange with the blood vessels, but remember that all of this is within a box and the dynamics of the box will have an influence on the dynamics of the airways. And this box is rigid, in this part, this is the chest wall, and the bottom part is a muscle, the diaphragm, which is moving. So we'll see in my presentation how all of this comes into action and how it develops and what might impede this development. Regarding uh, the airways, the differences between pediatric and adult are the airways, of course, are smaller and shorter in children. The tongue is larger in the oropharynx. The larynx is more anterior, and this is well known to physicians who intubate the babies. It's more difficult in the smaller babies. The epiglottis, as you can see here, this part is very soft, long and narrow, and uh, it can have it, it can be subject to inspiratory collapse with laryngomalacia. And also one important point is that in children less than 10 years, the narrowest portion of the glottis is below the vocal, below the level of the vocal cords. In adults, the narrowest portion is at the level of the vocal cords. And in children, it is below at the cricoid level, the subglottis. So young children are predisposed to what we call airway obstruction, and they will present with more wheezing, wheezing episodes. The airways divide and from the trachea to the distal airways, there are 23 divisions. And um, the airways are made up of three components. In fact, the inner part, which is in contact with the air we breathe, this is the part which is important for protection and cleansing of the airways. The middle part here with the smooth muscle and cartilage, this is important for the caliber and mechanical stability of the airways. And the outer part here with nerves and blood vessels, that's uh, important for the neurovascular supply. And of course, as we go more peripherally, the airways are more simplified and in the smaller airways, there are no more cartilage, as you can see here. The blue parts are the cartilage, which, sta which stabilize the airways, but this does not exist in the very peripheral airways. But we do have smooth muscle till the very end of the smaller airways, although the content is so low that bronchospasm in the more distal airways is negligible. 
Now remember that the airways are accompanied by a blood vessel. This is the pulmonary artery. In, this is very close to the airways. The airways is here. Uh, one example is here. This is the blood vessel, then capillaries, and the pulmonary vein will be in the wall of the lobule. So we have functional units in the airways. And you can see the limits of a lobule here. And remember also, and this is important for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, is that the airways are not suspended in midair. They are connected to the thoracic wall and to one another via the alveoli. And in the alveoli, there will be elastic fibers we call elastin, and this will have an influence on the diameter of the airways. It's as if the, the small alveoli are pulling open the airways. And if for one reason or the other, there are fewer alveoli, then there might be an effect on the size of the airways. If we open up the, the alveoli and lay them side by side, um, and, this, and, and determine the surface area of the lung for gas exchange, that would be half a tennis court in adults. So if you, if you, you, you can choose the one you like, a grass court or a clay court, but this is a huge surface for an adult and the gas would be able to go, oxygen would be able to go into the body and CO2 would be able to go out through a huge surface. And if we add all these small airways together, uh, one end to the other, this is also a huge distance, which is about 2,400 kilometers. That is the distance from Amsterdam to the tip of Italy. So when we deal with lung development, we have to preserve gas exchange and we have to preserve the number of alveoli or else we'll go halfway to Italy and, and we won't get there. So experiments have been done in uh, young children during the first months of life. And it, it has been de determined that even though it is written in textbooks that children have to breathe by their noses in fact, if the nose is blocked, they can compensate and breathe through the mouth. And this is an, an important factor, but it's best in situations like in bronchiolitis to in fact unblock the nose because it's the, the best way because heated air, which is filtered will get to the lungs and it's better for the airways. Now, uh, just to finish with this part, remember that the, the airways, the lungs are part of a three-stage rocket. It's just a first part. It's the external respiration. But what is important is the cardiovascular system and how it works and how it adapts after birth, but also the internal respiration at the level of the tissues, at the level of the, the muscles, the brain, etc. So if this one is not working too well, at least the other parts can compensate. And um, in fact, uh, regarding the lungs, we have at the adult age, twice as many alveoli as required. So there still is, there's still a lot of hope, even though there's lung disease, but it's better to preserve the entire lung since this will mean that we will have some spare tires just in case we have an accident one day. This, that was for the first part. Now let's look at how the lung develops during the first 1,000 days in normal conditions. So prior to birth, there will be lung morphogenesis. This is a picture of an embryo which is four to six weeks old. And as you can see, there's a rudimentary heart. There are um, bronchial arches a primary foregut, the oesophagus, and in the front of this primary foregut, there will be the bronchial buds and the trachea. So when we look at an interior view, 
you can notice that the trachea appears first and then the bronchial buds. And this is a division into two parts. It is what we call dichotomous branching. And so the lung will develop from a proximal to a distal uh, structure. And this is what we've just seen. This is a section through this part. There would be many stages, but now all of this is the embryonic stage. We have rudimentary tubes here and note that it is asymmetrical. And then from the embryonic stage, we'll go to the pseudoglandular stage, whereby the lungs resemble a small gland, a simplified gland here. Then we'll move on to the canalicular stage with small canals, and then saccular stage, rudimentary big sacs. Then in the middle of these sacs, we'll have primary septae. Here we're in the early alveolar stage, and then we'll have more complex divisions to increase the surface area. And this will be the secondary alveolar, alveolar alveolarization stage. And all of this is summarized in a paper we just uh, published. Uh, so here we have the dates right on top here. The trachea first and the bronchi, bronchi, bronchioli, the terminal bronchi. Please note that the divisions of the airways are terminated by 16 weeks at the end of the pseudoglandular stage. And then we'll go into the canalicular stage, the saccular stage, and the alveolar stage. And there will be normal growth of the alveolar sacs throughout life. So how do we go? How does dichotomous branching um, morphogeni morphogenesis develop? First, the lung fluid is very important. Now, let me just stress on the fact that the fluid within, within the lung is different from the amniotic fluid. Of course, they communicate, but it is quite different. The fluid in the lung is secreted by the lung cells and it contains lots of chloride and growth factors. If we, we replace the lung fluid with normal saline, and we need also to have fluid around the baby so that the, the, the lung growth can occur. So the lung liquid, the liquid inside of the lung, inside the body will increase with time. And here we are in mid gestation, the volume will be about 25 milliliter per kilo. And then towards the pre-labor stage, it will start to decrease here under the influence of epinephrine and also uh, will decrease quite a lot due to vaginal squeeze. The, the epinephrine effect will be on the uh, sodium water potassium channels. And also there will be uh, in the influence of pulmonary vas vasoconstriction and vasodilatation. So this lung fluid is important for lung development. And um, First, because fetal breathing movements with a closed glottis is important to increase the pressure into the lungs. And second, the, the, the effect of the airway smooth muscle cells is very important. It, as you can see here, the smooth muscle will appear very early during pregnancy, six weeks. And the neural crest cells, crest cells the nervous system also appears very early. So the role of the nervous system and the small muscle is like an architect of the lung. So first, the smooth muscle within the airway wall will increase chloride in the lung fluid, but also it is controlled by small pacemakers and there will be contractions like uh, in the intestine, peristaltic construction, contractions here. You can see in these um, images, in a fetus at the first trimester that there is contraction here, dilatation here. And the net effect is to bring the fluid towards the periphery where we have the lung bloods, lung buds, and this will uh, facilitate uh, the growth of the lung buds. 
so to summarize, this is these are the smooth muscle in red, contracting, pushing the fluid towards the periphery. And then there are substances which block the progression of the, the bud here, but there are also substances which are increasing the progression of the two buds on the side, like fi uh, fibroblast growth, growth factor 10, FGF10. And uh, so the bud will be obliged to divide into two, and this is what happens with uh, dichotomous branching, and this will increase the number of buds in the lung and the, the number of airways. So after birth, the force of contraction of the smooth muscle will decrease. As you know, there might be bronchospasm in asthma, but we think that asthma is just a, a return to a prenatal state because during the pregnancy, the smooth muscle is very active for lung development, but then afterwards, the body does not need much smooth muscles. So the force of contraction of the airways of smooth, smooth muscle in the airways is supposed to decrease. And when it does not decrease, this gives, this produces asthma. So what about alveolar growth? Alveolar growth uh, moves on from a simple sac to a more complex sac with primary septa, second receptor to increase surface area. So how does this happen? We need at the alveoli a double capillary layer. In normal adults, there's just one layer of capillaries in white here. So, and then the elastin fibers, as you can see on the, on the right side, the black parts correspond to the elastin fibers. They keep pulling on the side of the, of the wall, and this will produce a new a new wall, a new separation, and then this carries on over and over again. So it's very important to have a double capillary layer and also um, elastin fibers with a good nutrition. So in bronchopulmonary dysplasia, there is some accelerated maturation of the airways with uh, a, a simple capillary and so we have less alveoli and emphysema. This is a new type of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And as you can see, this is uh, on top the rudimentary alveoli, but we, what we're really aiming for is the very complex type of alveoli because this represents a huge surface area. So oxygen, artificial ventilation, problems with nutrition, or free oxygen radical injury, et cetera, et cetera, will prevent, and also systemic steroids will prevent the lung from maturing from A to B. And so in the end, we will have less surface area and a, a sort of predisposi predisposition to, 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 to small airways and also for gas exchange with the risk of hypoxia. This is just a summary of all the uh, growth factors, mediators, which are important during the embryonic development. I'd like to stress on the fact that vascular growth, VEGF, is important for alveogenesis. Vascular growth and alveogenesis are very uh, tightly linked. And also surfactant production depends also on mediators and when there are problems with, for example, the NKX, we have very severe lung disease. So surfactant is what is produced as from the 25th uh, uh, weeks of uh, gestation and uh, produced thro throughout life. And this is something which is secreted by the type two alveolar cells within the alveoli. And this surfactant is important to decrease the surface tension of the alveoli. And what's important is that it is uh, recycled, used over and over again. So it's important to have a stock of surfactant to start with, and this stock can be topped up giving, using ex exogenous surfactant. And, and this surfactant will 
uh, allow the alveoli to inflate as, at a faster rate compared to when there's no surfactant, the alveoli collapse and are harder to inflate like in hyaline membrane disease. What about the blood circulation? Blood circulation is uh, uh, also something which matures. It's here, the heart, and what's re in red, we have the dorsal root and the ventral root of the aorta. And there are communications between the two roots, the ventral root and the dorsal root in an anterior view. There will be involution, dis uh, disappearance of some of the aortic arches. And it won't be the same on the right and the left side. And so we will be sort of is uh, asymmetrical regarding our vascular system. And also, we all know this, uh, this uh, schematic representation of the circulation in utero with arterial blood coming from the placenta into the venous uh, ductus venosus and into the right atrium and then going right to the systemic circulation with some right to left shunt at the PDA. And this is very important in utero, but at birth, uh, things will change dramatically. So at birth, the, the vaginal squeeze will empty the lung of, of, of the liquid, plus in conjunction, the effect of epinephrine, the resistance in the pulmonary circulation will decrease and the resistance in the systemic circulation will increase. So there will be inverted shunt. As you can see, this is the normal procedure with closure of the PDA after a few hours and immediate closure of the foramen ova. But the lung will increase in size. So it's interesting to know what happens to the lung after birth. So this is a study by a team from Canada, from uh, uh, Australia and from Germany. Uh, using electrical impedance tomography. So this device allows the people to see how much air and how much water there is in the lungs. So this is a CT scan view of what's happening. Here on the left will be the observations after 25 seconds, after one or two cries. And as you can see, when the baby is crying to start with, air will be coming into the lungs but more on the right side compared to the left side and more in the non-dependent areas compared to the dependent areas at the bottom here. So this is very asymmetrical. When the baby starts crying for the first time, air goes right down to the right side. And you can see here the volume change in blue, the right side, it's changing nicely, but in, blue, in red, the red side is not doing too well. But after five minutes, things are much better on both sides, very symmetrical, as you can see here. So this is something which is uh, interesting. And they studied also the mechanisms indicating how the air is being uh, redistributed from the left to the right, from the right to the left. And uh, this is due to the partial closure of the glottis. And I think this is responsible for the grunting we, we hear, expiratory grunting with partial closure of the glottis to maintain FRC, functional residual capacity. And also the diaphragmatic contraction is slowing down, is breaking so that uh, the air is not going too fast out of the lungs. And so there will be exchanges between the different regions of the lungs from the black here to here and from the right to the to the left. This is called pendulum flow. And also they studied how the FRC is increasing with time. It increases quite fast, 50% after the first few breaths, and then very slowly using this mechanism to reach 100% of the normal values after uh, 60, 70 breaths. During the postnatal period, what happens? Well, it will be mostly uh, growth of the lung, but alveolar sacs will be um, synthesized, manufactured right to the adult age, as you will see in a, a future slide. And here on the right, uh, the different structures will be present uh, 
according to the penetration or the distance into the deep lung, as you can see. So this, this is a, a figure which summarizes, according to the age 0 to 25 years, the number of alveoli which have been counted by six authors. And it varies considerably, but during the first two years, the thousand days, there is a rapid increase in the number of alveoli. And thereafter, it will carry on increasing, but much more slowly. And so it is very important for nutrition and all the conditions to be reunited during the first two years to have a lot of alveoli and a lot of surface area uh, uh, to be better prepared for uh, adult life. The alveoli are important also for uh, gas exchange, but also to open up the airways because they are attached to the pleural surface and the airway diameter and also the expiratory flows are increased at higher lung volumes, as you can see here. It's uh, called tethering of the airways. If you have a lot of alveoli and the thoracic volume is important, is enough, this will pull on the airways and increase the size of the airways. And the airways, of course, will increase in size during the first two years of life in blue here. And in parallel, as I said earlier, the airway smooth muscle contractility will decrease. We don't need all that contractility anymore. And so we think that contractility of the smooth muscle is like the appendix of the lung. And also the airway wall con um, compliance will decrease, meaning the airway wall will increase in rigidity. So there will be less risk of bronchomalacia with time. Uh, and so we get to the chest wall, which increases with age, as you can see here. But there are fundamental differences between the function of the chest wall in adults and in children. As you can see, the younger child, the younger the child, the more the rib cage lacks mechanical efficiency. The diaphragm itself is more circular and more elevated and the ribs are less mineralized. So the rib cage here is rigid and here it's soft. So in the young child, the diaphragm is poorly adapted to increase the respiratory work of breathing. This horizontal insertion is not so good. The diaphragm has to work like a piston and here it works more like a, an umbrella. And uh, if, um, there is prolonged respiratory distress. This will be responsible for the Harrison, Harrison circus you can see here. Note that the respiratory rate will decrease from 46 in, in a very uh, young neonate to, to 12. And also this will be in parallel to the tidal volume. And also two last slides for the normal development, the immune system is not so, so good during the first two years, the first thousand days. Mucociliary clearance is not 100%. In its cells, alveolar macrophage function is not 100%. And toll-like receptor expression, antimicrobial proteins will take more time to mature. And also, as you all know, the immunoglobulin levels will be very low during the two, three to, to six months period, especially in patients who are born prematurely. So there will be an infectious and immune defense mechanism, which is not working well. And I won't go into the microbiome. So I just uh, stop here for the moment before I go to disease states. I don't know what, how much time I have left. I think we still have some time. Yeah. Any questions for this uh, part? No questions? Sorry, I can't hear. That. Ah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. During during 
Asama on uh, 70s, I spent uh, Asama in uh, the uh, micro visitors of in the Edward Herriot Hospital, south uh, in the Presqu'île of Giants, south uh, south France uh, near Marseille. Two 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 uh, two, two uh, French uh, pediatricians were um, very very uh, excellent, Doctor Chevalier and Doctor Chasalet were founders of the of the uh, French uh, cystic cystic fibrosis uh, uh, association uh, i don't I, I don't have an, a news about uh, them do you do you know something or oh, dr chasalet uh, uh, dr chevalier uh, i have i have not known them personally but i have known gabriel Bellon. Doc, Professor Gabriel Bilan from Edouard Herriot uh, Hospital in Lyon, and uh, yeah. and and his uh, yeah. uh, student, uh, his student uh, who's become a professor who's replaced him, and uh, he's called yes. Professor Rex in cystic fibrosis uh, treatment. Yes. Yes. Uh, Edouard Herriot Hospital uh, belong uh, belong to the hospital of uh, uh, Lyon. Okay. He, he, it was ad, adult, adult, adult cystic fibrosis or pediatric? No, 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 no. pediatric cystic fibrosis. Pediatric, yes. Uh, so in, it's, uh, in, in the in the in the in the Yes. In, in, in the, the, the Ah, the okay, okay. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, south of France. So, yes. near, near Marseille. Yes, I know. I understand. Sorry, I misunderstood. It is uh, now a center for prolonged. Uh, uh, management with uh, retraining of cystic fibrosis patients, children and adults. La Presqu'île de Gien, yeah, near Marseille. It's exactly. a nice place. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice place. Yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah, patients yeah, yeah, like yeah. to go there to, to, to train for cystic fibrosis. Okay. In, any other Thank questions? You very much. So, or I can go and finish with the disease states and cystic fibrosis also, if you want. Or do you want me to stop here? Claude, je continue ou j'arrête? Micro. Claude. Tu, oui, 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 oui. Claude. tu continues, c'est très bien. Enfin, y a, je crois qu'il n'y a rien bon, à okay. dire de, de plus sur ton exposé magnifique. So, okay. let me just okay. um, give you an insight. Can you see the screen again? Yes. Yes, so now let's talk about disease states because this is important. Uh, overall, in general, the question is, why uh, does the lung develop and grow in a bad way? What goes wrong? What induces disease? So it can be genetics, and we talked about cystic fibrosis. It can be the environment, the feed, the smoke and everything. It can be the development of the lung something goes wrong, it's, I've just shown you lung development and it's a very complex process depending on many factors, lung fluid, uh, growth factors, uh, chest movements, uh, elastin, nutrition and things like that. So many things can go wrong. And sometimes everything is right, but it just, it's just um, a delay in maturation. And also, Sometimes the lung is not so bad, and then we have a disease, and then we have sequelae, and then there are other factors. So let's just put the different diseases on this slide. Cystic fibrosis is mainly a genetic autosomic recessive disease. Of course, it's a manifestation, man, clinical manifestations will also depend on the environment. Antenatal cigarette smoke, smoke exposure is something which is very important, which a huge impact on the lung. And I'll show you some images. And this is one of the main um, targets we should all have because this can be treated very easily. Then the malformations, in most cases, they are sporadic, meaning it's something to do with the development of this baby, not genetic based, but there are also malformations with a genetic basis with many other malformations, cardiac malformations, ENT malformations. 
maturation, an example is Airway Malaysia. Everything is fine, but the cartilage is soft. So babies are, are not too, doing too well during the first two or three years, and then they get better and we don't do anything else. We just diagnose and reassure the parents. Acute viral bronchiolitis like COVID will depend a lot on the environment, but in some patients, the airways are a bit small, smaller to start with. So there might be some environment plus some genetic component in some cases. Bronchiolitis obliterans is a sequela of acute viral bronchiolitis with fibrosis of the inner part of the airways. And so we will have fixed airway obstruction. And this is uh, to do with sequela of uh, viral infection. Asthma, of course, wheezing. This is very frequent, around three children out of 10. And it depends on genetics, but it's not simple genetics like cystic fibrosis, but polygenic genetics and the expression will depend of course on the environment, cigarette smoke exposure, allergies and things like that. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is something to do with uh, development, maturation, also the environment if baby has preterm delivery and also we heard this morning it can be due to the risk is increased with fetal growth restriction, but we now know that there is also a genetic component with a SPOC2 gene. And also malnutrition is very important. We'll see some examples of what happens on the, on the lungs. Prematurity and aspiration syndromes, it's when the baby is putting a lot of gastric acid because we're feeding them too much, putting the gastric acid into the lungs. And this is uh, damageable, not good for the lungs with a risk of sequela from a simple initial insult. And in some cases, there might be neoplasm. So first, the airway diseases, the, air, the tubes, which can give cough, wheezing, infections. This can be classified according to pathology into congenital, like anatomical disease, tracheal bronchus, agenesia, or syndromes, like uh, Cystic fibrosis is a syndrome which is which involves the, the airways. Williams Campbell syndrome, it's a syndrome in which there is no cartilage in the airways, in the peripheral airways. But in most cases it is acquired. So either the airway wall is thickened, dilated, or obstructed. And um, I won't go into the details, but uh, when there's a evol involvement of the airway wall, the baby, if the airway wall is small, the baby will wheeze. If the airway wall is damaged, there will be infection. If the airway wall contain contains a lot of secretions, baby would cough. Regarding the, the parenchyma, if uh, there is less alveoli, then instead of having half a tennis court, we'll have a, a small squash court, so decreased surface area. But also, in some instances, the airway wall itself will be thickened. When it's thick, oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide will have problems to go across the barrier, so we'll have impaired diffusion of gases. So all of this will increase the risk of hypoxemia, cyanosis, decreased uh, pulse oximetry saturation. And also when there is less um, alveoli, as I said earlier, there would be less tethering and decreased diameter of the airways. This is the case with COPD. In some cases we have COPD like in antenatal smoking or different types of disease diseases. Also in BPD, or when we administer too much and too early systemic steroids, less alveoli. In asthma, not so much uh, uh, involvement of the peripheral of the alveoli, but the very young age uh, is related. We, there, are, there are less alveoli in the very young children and in premature children. And also when the mothers smoke during pregnancy, 
there are less alveoli. So many different causes, but same consequence. And this is just to show you how fragile these babies are. They go into bronchial obstruction with hypoxemia because the airways are small. They, they secrete a lot of mucus and the airway wall itself is uh, very thin, uh, very thick. They have a lot of work of breathing so that they get tired very easily. And there is less uh, elastic recoil and uh, ventilatory asynchronism due to problems with the diaphragm. And so in the end, they go into cyanosis quite easily and they wheeze quite easily and go into bronchospasm. So in specific clinical situations, for example, this is fetal growth restriction, which primarily affects the development process during the late stages of in utero development. The weight of the organ itself is not a reliable indicator of the effects of early nutrition uh, anomalies or nutrient restrictions. And the pathophysiology depends on multiple detrimental effects, antioxidants, the defense mechanism, which won't be so good when the fetal growth is restricted. The surfactant will not be produced as well. The endocrine status is different. Steroids will be high, catecholamines will be high, prostaglandins will be high. So in the end, we'll have impaired alveolar formation with enlarged alveoli with little surface area and thicker blood septa and less elastin. And this will be persistent in animals throughout life. There will be increased risk of adverse metabolic and respiratory complications very early after the postnatal period. The effect on the organ on the lung itself will be either immediate after birth with the risk of hypoxemia during the first two weeks of life, but also throughout life, there will be decreased expiratory flow due to impaired airway development and alterations in lung parenchyma, the alveoli, and also the muscle, the diaphragm, uh, function and there will there will be more infections and this can be tracked throughout the entire life cycle from the neonate to the uh, to the adult age so what happens during the early period as in the other presentations on nutrition will can be tracked right up to adult age this is for fetal growth restriction antenatal smoking here when mother smokes during pregnancy, nicotine is the main culprit. It is concentrated by the placenta and goes into the lungs and the body system of the fetus. The concentration can go up to eight times the concentration in the mother, in the mother's blood. So what goes down is the weight of the lung. This was done in monkeys. The body weight will decrease by 8% but the lung weight and the lung volume will decrease by 12 and 13%. So all is, all is small, all are small, but the lung is even smaller than the body. So this is called lung hypoplasia. The airways are narrowed because there's a huge deposition of collagen in the airways. So we have uh, smaller airways and reduced number of alveoli. What is increased is airway hyperresponsiveness because there's much more uh, muscle, but also reduced number of alveoli means smaller airways, thicker blood gas barrier with risk of hypoxemia, and also a risk of uh, thickened pulmonary arteries with pulmonary hypertension. So smoking during pregnancy is even worse than smoking after birth. And this will be responsible for wheezing. There are many types of wheezing during the first years of life. There's children who never wheeze with lung function here. Uh, the children who wheeze late, children who wheeze early and the antenatal smoking will 
induce early smoking with reduced lung function. But after birth, if mother does not smoke in the presence of the baby, there will be some catch up growth in lung function. But as you can see here, at the age of six years, the lung function remains low throughout life. It never goes right up to the normal situation. So the early phenotype with some improvement, but incomplete improvement when mother smokes during pregnancy. And we have done a study which shows that according to the number of cigarettes, the duration of cumulative duration of hospital Hospitalization during the first thousand days will increase. This is from zero to two years. If mother smokes, she will spend quite a lot of time in hospital with the baby due to acute wheezing. And there is a relationship between the medium time of hospitalization and the number of cigarettes which she will be, which she would have smoked during pregnancy. And there is no threshold effect. So best would be zero cigarettes but if you can reduce from here to, to here it's still good substance abuse with all these substances you can see alcohol tobacco opiates canna, cannabinoids caffeine psychostimulants they have impacts on a lot of um, targets in the lung in the in the body like uh, growth defects, cardiac problems, cranial, but in general, the effect, the impact on the lung development is not so, is not so much. It's more about, uh, uh, it's more, it's, it, it more about uh, other things, except for opiates where there might be respiratory insufficiency, but this is more uh, a central mechanism. It, we, it won't uh, impact on the, the fetal growth too much. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia with uh, antenatal exposure to steroids, chorioamniotitis, uh, growth restriction, and a genetic susceptibility will result in uh, premature delivery and with additional insults uh, in bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is responsible for alveolar growth arrest, central airway disease, smaller airways, fixed peripheral airway narrowing, airway hyperresponsiveness, bronchomalacia, pulmonary hypertension, and abnormal response to hypoxia with cyanosis. And uh, these babies, if we look at the normal lung function from zero to 25, which is here, and then decrease with age. These babies are way less, they below, they still increase their lung function, but they are still below the normal um, situations and they can present with symptoms or disability very easily. And hopefully they don't smoke, they won't increase the loss of lung function when they're up to adulthood. I was talking this morning about what tracks the gain in lung function. And this was a study which was conducted in South um, America in 71 preterm infants. And lung functions were performed at six months of age and one year of age. And the aim was to see whether it was length, height, or anything else, which uh, correlated with improved lung function. And the answer is that it is height, velocity, which is best correlated to lung function like in FEV 0.5 with an R of 0.44. And this was highly significant, but it was not correlated with age. So patients with BPD have lower lung function than those without BPD. There is no catch up growth. Yes, it improves, but it's not accelerating. And the slow gain seems to be more dependent on BPD itself rather than preterm birth. And as I said earlier, the increase in length is closely associated to the increase in lung function. So more than head circumference or body weight, uh, length appears to be very interesting, at least from the pulmonary perspective. Lung malformations. So you've seen the different steps in lung development. And when things go wrong, if it's an early step, it might give 
huge large airway diseases like is, is, is esophageal atresia or laryngeal atresia at seven, eight weeks that we're still in the branching phase. So there might be uh, abnormal, uh, anormalities in the airway, airway tree or diaphragmatic hernia or problems with vascular, vascularization. At a later stage here, 17, 15 to 17 weeks, we will have the cystic lesions like CCAM, sequestrations, uh, bronchial atresia or lobar emphysema and prematurity will uh, involve the development of the airways. It's not a malformation, but it's an, a development alveol um, impairment of the alveoli, at least for the new type of bron bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And this is just to remind you uh, of what a CCAM, a congenital cystic adenoid malformation looks like after birth and before birth in utero. Airway malicia, this is an airway, it's not the normal size and the size is decreased on the right side here. This is an endoscopic view and this is a bronchomalacia, right side normal and normal size and this is the decreased size. So there's no abnormality, nothing uh, wrong, it's just the cartilage, the middle part of the lung, which is supposed to ensure stability, which is not working well. There are three types. First type, which is idiopathic. Type two, which is due to a lesion outside of the airways. And type three, it is acquired damage to the airways. Bronchiolitis, just infection of the airways with epithelial shedding. Most of the, in most cases, things get better, but in some cases, uh, there will be some fibrous tissue which is occluding the airways completely. It is very important for pregnant mothers who are giving birth to apply the COVID measures very early to avoid bronchiolitis in these very young babies who have lungs which are developing. I have tried to get the obstetricians to warn the mothers to wash their hands and prevent infections in these babies at seven, eight days of life. And I think uh, COVID has helped us a lot in this, uh, in this battle. Asthma, there are many types of asthma. In asthma, there is inflammation, bronchial secretions, um, uh, bronch uh, bronchoconstriction and also in, um, hyperactivity and there are many types of asthma and I won't go into all the details but this is something very important which we have to prevent uh, with interve early interventions in the environment because we can't change the genetics. So we get to cystic fibrosis. Uh, we now have animal models of cystic fibrosis and this is an, a, a lung of a, a CF pig CF is uh, mucoviscidose in French. And uh, as you can see here, the secretions are very thick with a lot of neutrophils. And we know that there are lots of bacteria here. Very early, we will have Pseudomonas, Staph aureus. And this is due to a genetic de uh, defect. And now cystic fibrosis is not just a lung disease. It's also an intestinal disease and also a hepatic disease pancreatic disease. So it's a multi-systemic disease. And in France, uh, there is newborn screening, which is done at two or three days. And this is important for growth, body growth, lung growth, lung health, and to reduce hospital stay. So what happens is there is this genetic mutation and then the CFTR protein won't work so well. And uh, so there will be defective mucociliary clearance and then airways obstruction, infection, and this vicious cycle with inflammation. So in the past, we used to do physiotherapy here. We used to treat with antibiotics and we tried to give some anti-inflammatories, but we don't have too good uh, anti-inflammatories. But now we have very expensive, oops, sorry, modulator therapy. We can't change the gene. 
but we can intervene on the protein. And so we have correctors, we have uh, uh, potentiators. So we get the, all the CFTR protein working well. So what happens is that uh, it improves lung function in these very young children, less than one year of age. Here is uh, uh, placebo with this lung clearance index. It's an index of redistribution of air in the lung. It doesn't change with placebo, but it improves with Ivacaftor. And also we can improve pancreatic function. This is elastase in the stools. We can improve pancreatic function in the, in the intestine and improve body weight and thus lung development. This was not possible before. We used to give pancreatic enzymes. We still do, but we give less pancreatic enzymes. And of course, if we don't have pancreatic enzymes, we can give any types of calories or lipids, they won't be reabsorbed. So now we are doing studies to be able to give all these modulator therapies very early on at the moment, in some cases, it would be at the, at the age of one year, but we still need to give it even earlier uh, at birth, but we need further control trials. So I have come to the end of my presentation. So we need to understand by pathophysiological studies, the airway diseases, the lung diseases to give appropriate treatment in order to prevent what we call PCOAD, pediatric chronic suppurative, non-suppurative obstructive airway disease and or bronchiectasis. Here is a paper we just published with um, all the different um, diseases we can encounter in pediatrics. The heat maps, the color codes represent the incidence of the disease. And for example, cigarette smoke would be throughout life. So thoracic malformations, are early in preterms, bronchopulmonary dysplasia in preterms. And then from one disease, we can move to another disease. But in the end, what we really want to prevent is uh, COPD, pediatric coad, and bronchiectasis. And also, let me remind you that we can track lung function from antenatal childhood, adolescent into uh, adult, adulthood. And the green is a normal lung function, and lung function can go bad even prior to birth if we're not careful. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm ready to discuss, uh, take a few questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Jewish uh, presentation. And uh, we now is a uh, term for, uh, is uh, time for uh, questions. Any questions? Michael. Just, just a you. precision. Uh, what is the syndrome of Cartagena? Uh, so Cartagena syndrome is what we call primary ciliary dyskinesia. Uh, it's uh, the very superficial part of the epithelium, which is in direct contact with the air we breathe. So we have very small cilia, which are beating like... Uh, in a synchronized manner to remove the, the, the things, we, air particles, allergens, like a conveyor belt coming out all the time, even when we sleep and it's clean, cleaning the lung. And Cartagena syndrome is when these cilia in the, in the, in the epithelium doesn't work. So um, this can happen with or without what we call situs inversus. So when it's associated with uh, an inverted, uh, uh, you know, we're not symmetrical. The liver is on the right, the aorta is on the left. So when it's situs inversus, everything is inverted. The liver is on the left and the heart is on the right. This is called Cartagena syndrome. And what, what is the evolution? So it's a COPD, basically, it's uh, untreatable for the moment. It's not like cystic fibrosis. In cystic fibrosis, at least we have protein therapy. Uh, in uh, Cartagena syndrome, it's like a small cystic fibrosis without the nutritional aspects. And uh, 
they get infected, they have ear, nose and throat infections because you have cilia everywhere. And um, uh, we, we have to give antibiotics uh, and we, re we remain symptomatic in our management. Yeah. Michael, can I, can I ask uh, uh, a, a common and actual uh, uh, reality? Uh, can, uh, what is the reason why uh, the infant and children suffer from COVID-19 less, less uh, respiratory uh, uh, disease and less uh, systemic disease? Yes, uh, so COVID-19 lung disease is decreased in children. We, there are many explanations, but nothing is formal. The first is that there is a receptor for COVID in the lung of adults, and this receptor is decreased in children. It's like a no, lock and the key. This receptor is called S angiotensin converter enzyme is, and it's uh, decreased in, 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 in the lungs of babies. Uh, this is to do with maturation. And I have just seen a paper in adults to show that the prognosis of COVID depends on the number of ACE receptors in the body, in the blood of, of the adults. So that might be one explanation. The second is that we are vaccinating the babies a lot. So babies are, uh, and also they have a lot of infection, yes, 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 viral infection. So, yes, so, yes. so, so well, these are explanations, but they, they also have PIMS, uh, other types of uh, COVID disease. And uh, it might be cardiovascular, it might be osteoarticular, it might be long COVID. So they are not 100% uh, uh, safe from COVID. So in France, there's a huge debate for vaccination in 12 year olds and more. And we are more in favor of vaccinating the children, despite uh, the fact that they are not so much at risk. There's also the psychiatric uh, uh, impact. But uh, there are cases which have been uh, shown uh, to come back to the neonatal uh, aspect there have been cases uh, shown in paris in clama hospital to show that maternal covid can infect the fetus through the transplacent placental route and we still have to be careful with covid uh, in pregnant mothers okay thank you okay. 